let's do this. We got a little bit less time than I thought, but I think I think we should still be fine. Uh, so I asked if I could talk to you all tonight because I wanted to do this lecture that I did for the first time a few days ago for the other lab, and I like didn't do as good a job as I, I wanted to, and there were like some things that came up in the discussion, and so I went back and spent some more time doing it, and I think it's pretty good. Uh, I think they liked it. So the title of this lecture is called The Art of Block Writing. And it is inspired by a person named Frank Sieber. Does anyone know who that is? Does anyone just like, yeah. Uh, Frank Sieber was the longtime coach at Woodward, which is where Maggie and I work now. Uh, and he coached at Woodward from uh, 1997 until 2006. And um, Seth Gannon, who you all know, um, has, does a lot of things that are kind of Seaver inspired. And he had a very distinctive uh, personality and very distinctive coaching style. And one thing that Seth said about Seaver is that regardless of what event Seaver coached, he was going to be a great coach. Uh, it didn't matter if he was a debate coach or if he was a basketball coach or a football coach or a, you know, a, a dance coach. He was going to be a great coach. And the reason he was going to be a great coach is that he thought a lot and put a lot of emphasis on preparation. And he had a really strong commitment to making sure that his debaters were well prepared. Uh, and when I got to Woodward, I got a, access to a bunch of kind of old stuff that, that Seaver had written. And I had for a long time been inspired by things that he had said about debate. Um, and I really liked, you know, his judge philosophy was one of the best judge philosophies um, in the kind of mid 2000 era when the judge philosophy wiki um, was first starting. And he was, he was just a really influential coach. Uh, and there's this really cool handout that I, that I found that he used to give to his debaters. And the, the version that we have that's uh, electronic is from about 2003 or 2004. And it goes through the steps of doing debate research and writing debate blocks. And it's one of the coolest things that I've, I've seen. Um, and it's, it's the coolest thing that we have uh, from the Seaver era. And so I wanted to share some of the lessons that he was teaching his students in 2003 with you all. Uh, but I wanted to update some of it to reflect the changes in debate that have occurred over the last 10 years uh, now since that was written. And so this lecture is kind of very much inspired by Seaver. Um, and I'm going to share some of the specific things that he said, but then I'm also going to kind of broaden it and expand the scope of this to reflect uh, the paperless era. And I'm going to start with a pretty extended quotation from Seaver. And this is, uh, this will give you a pretty good idea of kind of what he was about. This is uh, a quotation from this handout that he would give to his students. Blocking. The construction of arguments and evidence to be used in a debate round is an essential skill for any good debater. I think it is impossible to be a good debater without being a good blocker. I would consider the actual in-round debating as the soul of our activity, but it is the blocking of debate arguments that represents the heart of the game. It has been said that debate's greatness comes from it being the unique nexus of preparation, strategy, and execution. Block writing touches all these aspects of our game. Clearly, blocking is an essential part for the preparation for a debate. Blocking done properly sets up the strategic options for the debate. And the better the blocks that one has, the easier it becomes to execute within the debate. The best thing about blocking is that anyone can do it. It represents the ultimate level playing field of competition. I enjoy debate because it richly rewards hard work. Blocking serves as the foundation of this hard work. Anyone can be a good blocker. From this, anyone can be a good debater. Frank Siever. Uh, and I just love that quotation. And I think that whether I knew it or not, I've, I've kind of been teaching that for a long time. Uh, and so that's kind of that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. So there are three parts to this. The first part, the first Roman numeral, is how to conceptualize your blocks, uh, in which I try to describe um, kind of my philosophy of block writing, which is very much inspired by the philosophy of Frank Siever. Uh, second, I'm going to share with you the nine universal truths of good block writing that Seaver provided in his handout in 2003. And then third, I'm going to provide the five guiding principles of good paperless block writing, which uh, is kind of my take on the universal truths that Seaver uh, espoused uh, back then. So Roman numeral one, how to conceptualize your blocks. <laughs> Number one, blocks are the foundation of debate success. Uh, I think I've teased this to you all before, but I really like using the word materials when I describe uh, the things that we use to prepare for our debates because materials is an expansive word. There's a lot of different things that we can use in our debates. There's a lot of background knowledge, there's a lot of anecdotes, there's a lot of statistics, there's a lot of cards, and there's a lot of pre-written arguments. 
Blocks are the most important materials you bring with you into the debate because they're the combination of the evidence and the analytical arguments that you write beforehand based on your research and based on your, your thinking about uh, debates that you're going to have. And you should have a lot of them. Uh, when you're preparing to be affirmative, you need to have a lot of affirmative blocks. You need to have blocks to every specific thing you can think of that the negative might say against your affirmative, and you need to have as many blocks to generic arguments that you can think of uh, that the negative might say against your affirmative. When you're negative, you need to have blocks to answer every affirmative response to your negative arguments that you can think of. So when you're, you're preparing a counter plan, you need to have blocks that respond to everything the affirmative is likely to say <coughs> against your counter plan. If it's a critique, you need blocks to the things the affirmative is going to uh, say against your critique. You need extensions and answers to the arguments that the affirmative will make on the case. So you need to not just have some arguments about the case, but you need to have front lines and back lines, developed blocks about the case. But blocks are the foundation of successful debating because it's the materials that you prepare before the debate that distill your research and your uh, analysis and your expertise into scriptable, <laughs> repeatable, deliverable uh, items that you, that you introduce in the debate. Number two, blocks are the high quality ingredients you need to prepare an excellent meal. And this is an extended food analogy that I think is helpful. Uh, how many of you know something about cooking? How many of you are cooks, chefs, maybe? Okay. I don't know that much about cooking. I can't cook. But I love to watch cooking shows on TV. And I try to learn every, you know, something about debate from everything that, I, that I'm into or that I, that I pay attention to. And the thing that I've learned, uh, and kind of the analogy that I came up with as I watch uh, great chefs prepare uh, meals is uh, an analogy to mise en place. Do we know what, anybody heard that word before? That phrase? Does anybody know what that means? Alright, it's a French term that basically means, I think it's translated officially or, uh, you know, uh, literally as put in place. But it's what professional kitchens do to get ready to prepare the meals and the dishes that they're going to make. So it's the uh, the kind of preparation of all of the ingredients that are going to be necessary to prepare that, that uh, night's menu. So it's, you know, preparing and, and cutting and slicing the meat and the sauces and the spices and the vegetables and the, uh, you know, the, the uh, sauces, whatever, I don't know if I said that, just all the kind of things that go into the preparation uh, of a meal. And, you know, usually a sous chef will help with that or multiple sous chefs, but when a, when a <coughs> chef starts to prepare a meal, they have all of the essential ingredients immaculately prepared beforehand. They don't just, you know, they're not like, all right, I'm going to make this dish, and so I need to have some carrots cut. So I'll, I'll go get the carrots out of the fridge, and I'll start, you know, preparing the carrots. The carrots are already prepared, and they take these pre-prepared, uh, expertly prepared <coughs> ingredients, and they make the dish out of that. I think that's exactly what we do in debate. We take everything that we can prepare before the debate, we prepare it. And we want to have immaculately prepared materials, uh, which in, if it was making a meal, it would be called an ingredient. If it's in a debate, we would call it an argument. We have all of these pre-prepared arguments. And in the debate, we put those arguments, those ingredients together to present to the judge the best possible package of arguments, or the best possible dish, the best possible meal. And the reason that a good chef prepares all of those items before they start cooking is that it ensures that they can give the most attention to detail possible about all those small things. If you needed to you know, cut up the carrots and cut the onions and prepare the sauce and prepare the spices and all of that. While you were making someone's uh, dish, you'd have to hurry, you'd have to rush, you'd, you'd have to kind of cut corners and, and you wouldn't have the best version of the carrots or the best version of the spices or the sauces or whatever. When you do it in advance, you can focus your cooking time, your, your meal preparation time, on maximizing the, the kind of consistency of the of the dish you can do all the small things you can focus on plating you just you just have so much more time to do the small things that separate you know average chefs from advanced and, and you know world class chefs if a chef doesn't have all of those ingredients ready to go they can't prepare a very good meal and i think that that analogy applies well to debate if you don't have the ingredients you need to make a good speech ready to go before the in round prep time you can't deliver an excellent speech you can't put together those ingredients on the fly. It's just too difficult. And it, it's, it's not that you're bad at debate that you can't do that. No one can do that. Uh, in order to be an excellent chef, 
You have to have your mise en place in place in order to be an excellent debater. You have to have your blocks in place and ready to go. Number three, blocks must be edited. Uh, obviously, your blocks include cards. They include analytical arguments. Um, but for most arguments, for most blocks, there are a lot of things that you could say. <coughs> and you know, the biggest problem that I identify with most students is that they don't spend enough time writing blocks. They don't spend enough time preparing blocks. Uh, but the second most troubling thing, or the second mistake that students make the most, uh, most frequently, is that they make blocks that are unusable because they, anything that they could think of to say, they include that. They say that. So, you know, I, well, I could say this to answer this dissent, so I'll throw that in there. And I could say this, and I got this card. Ooh, I actually got two cards about this. Let's throw both of those in there. You know, those are good. Those apply to this. Uh, and they think just, they don't think about what the best arguments to make are. They just think, all right, do I have something to say? Let me just put those things under this heading, and then, all right, I'm good. I got a block. You need to think realistically about whether you're making the best arguments, and you have to think realistically about how many arguments you're going to be able to fit into any particular debate. It's really hard for you to eliminate things. You know, a lot of you do research and you'll cut, you know, 10 cards, and you have 10 pretty good cards on the same issue. Uh, and when it comes time to write the block, you know, you're like, eh, they're all kind of good. I guess this one's best. I'll put it at the top, then I'll copy the other nine right below, and I'll figure it out in the debate. I'm good. I got nine or 10 really good cards on this argument. That doesn't work, because in the debate, that's not a real usable block. That doesn't differentiate warrants. That doesn't set you up to have a layered argument. That doesn't allow you to think, all right, this is the card I should read first, and this is the warrant that I should highlight in that card, and then I should read this other card, and I should highlight this other warrant in that card. And there's an important analytical argument which needs to be made that connects the warrants in those two cards to the argument that they're likely to make. Or I need to make a comparison that is in this other card. I'm not going to read that card because I don't have time and the card isn't as good, but it, it gave me the idea for a comparison that I should introduce analytically. And so I need to say this warrant from this card, this warrant from that card, and then this analytical comparison that's grounded in this card that I'm not even going to read. Until you have thought about that, you haven't finished your block. You just have put together things that you could say against a particular argument. And that's, you know, that's helpful. You should certainly do that. If you're not doing that, then this is a good step one. But step two to being an excellent block writer is that it's not just a collection of things you could say. It's the things that you should say. And it's the best arguments that you can make. A couple of tips related to this. On almost every block, each card or each argument should have one warrant. You should separate your warrants. It's much less helpful to have three cards about the same warrant or two cards that both make you know, kind of three arguments and they're the same three arguments than to have three cards, one that makes this argument, one that makes this argument, one that makes the third argument. By not repeating yourself and by making it very easy to flow the tag of each of these arguments, and by making each tag an independent warrant, it makes your block much more difficult to answer. It adds a, a triple layer uh, to your block instead of allowing the other team to just kind of group in and then answer your argument and then in, in the later speech kind of try to resuscitate your warrants and say, well, they grouped our arguments, uh, but in our three cards, you know, we actually made these three arguments. I know you didn't know that at the time, but we're letting you know now that they have dropped these arguments and, you know, isn't that a shame? You should vote for us because, you know, they've dropped our arguments. That, that doesn't work. If you present the warrants carefully, and if you tag your arguments clearly, uh, and if you front load those, those labels, then the judge is more likely to believe your argument, and it just makes debating much easier. Another tip. Uh, everyone is kind of on board with the, the idea that really short cards are bad, which is true. Almost all of the time, a really short card uh, isn't good because it just doesn't have as <coughs> enough words to develop the arguments. But just because really short cards are bad doesn't mean really long cards are good. Uh, it's not just the size of the, of the excerpt that matters. It's the quality of the argument. And one way to think about cards, think about how good they are, is what's the percentage of the text in the card that I'm going to highlight and introduce to the judge in the debate? If it's a really high ratio, you know, most of the text that I've excerpted is being communicated to the judge, to me that's a good card. Because that means that you're communicating a lot of what the author said, You've been selected, you're making a single argument uh, that's supported by this piece of evidence. Cards that have much lower percentages of text highlighted and communicated to the judge to me aren't as good of cards because it indicates that there is a lot of stuff that the author has said that you're not introducing as evidence. There's a lot more stuff between the little lines that you have highlighted. Uh, and you're not getting as in-depth. The author didn't intend to make uh, to fully flesh out the arguments that you're making. You're kind of artificially listing those arguments. 
Uh, and then the last thing is just be realistic. Uh, I kind of already mentioned this, but be realistic about how long you're going to have in a real debate to express an argument. The first argument on your block makes so much, uh, is so much more important than any other argument because in a lot of situations you only have time to say one thing. So the first card on your environment impact defense frontline or your first card in the 2AC to this case argument or whatever is by far the most important card. And the second card is substantially less important and the third card is almost not important at all for most arguments. Don't count on being able to read your third card or your fourth card uh, to get the best argument into the debate. And certainly there are exceptions. If you know you're always going to make six arguments against politics at least and you want to put your, your best argument as number six, you know, all that makes a lot of sense. But be purposeful about it. Don't, don't just have to luck into reading your best evidence. Put your best evidence first, your best argument first, uh, and be realistic about how many arguments you can place on a block. A 2AC to a case argument that includes five cards and six analytic arguments is totally useless because there is no situation in which you would have that much time in the 2AC to say all of that. Number four, blocks must be modular. Modular. This acknowledges the reality of editing and it acknowledges the reality of context and the importance of context. Because you never know how long you're going to have in a particular debate to answer an argument, it doesn't make sense to have only one version of important blocks. Uh, in one debate, for example, you know, the one in C might include the neoliberalism K and nothing else. And so you'll need to have a very well-developed version of your neoliberalism frontline. And that might mean that for the alternative argument, you have a couple of cards. For the impact argument, you have a couple of cards. You know, the permutation has a couple of cards. You've got some case outweighs stuff. You've got a longer version of your framework argument. Uh, you have a lot more long versions of arguments that you want to get into that frontline. In another debate, the neoliberalism K is red, and it's one of six off-case positions. And you need a, a much shorter version. You need the bare-bones version of the permutation or of the framework. You need a, a shorter, maybe one-card version of your impact argument or a one-card version of your alternative argument. If you think about your, your blocks to the neoliberalism K not as here's my 2AC, but here's my 2AC framework. Here's the short version, here's the long version. Here's my 2AC impact turn. You know, the best card is first. If I only get time for one card, that's the one I'll read. Here's my 2AC neoliberalism K you know, uh, impact argument. If I only have time for one card, it's this first one. You can then much more easily piece together the appropriate components in the debate. What many of you do is you just have a stack of neoliberalism cards and you have one 2AC frontline and it'll make like six arguments or seven arguments. And if you need more arguments, you'll just start reading cards kind of at random. Maybe you've thought a little bit about it, but you'll just add in a bunch of cards. And you won't change the structure. You'll still say the same seven arguments, but then you'll say an eighth, and a ninth, and a tenth, and an eleventh, and you'll read a bunch of cards. And you haven't thought about why you're reading those cards, and you haven't thought about where you're reading those cards, and uh, you're not, you, you didn't really put any thought into it at all. You're just kind of, all right, I need more to say on neoliberalism. Let's empty the tub on that. Don't do that. You can have full versions, so you can have your like, this is my normal 2AC given, you know, I have like a minute and 15 seconds or whatever, a minute 30 to answer this in the 2AC. You can certainly have that, but don't only have that. It doesn't make sense to only have that. It made more sense to only have that in the days of paper when you couldn't have multiple copies of everything, but in the days of paperless, your tub is limitless in size. So don't fall victim to the, the paper era version of, of blocking. Do it in a modular fashion. Another really important tip that I don't think people do uh, as much as I even think they do. One of the wonderful things about paperless is that you can time how long it takes you to read arguments and then you can put how long it takes right there in the block title. So that every time you look at a block, you know exactly how long that will take you. So if you're a second affirmative, you should know how long all of your 2AC blocks take. So if you know that you have three minutes to spend on the neoliberalism K, you can just quickly do the math and be like, all right, well, I can say all of that in three minutes, moving that over, done. If you have no idea, or you're just guessing, it's very easy to say, oh, three minutes, uh, let's try that. And then it turns out that you had you know, read too many framework arguments, too many permutation arguments, and by the time you get down to your impact argument or your alternative argument and kind of the meat of your strategy, you don't have very much time left, and you have to rush through and just say one card. And if you had thought about it, that's not the three-minute version of the neoliberalism frontline that you would come up with had you thought about it, but you didn't think about it, and you didn't know. If you're a second negative, knowing exactly how long it takes to answer each argument, to read each block on the counter plan or on the disadvantage or on the critique or whatever, can help immensely with budgeting time for the negative block. If you can look at their 2AC and you've got a pretty good idea of which blocks you need to read and how much time you're going to be off of your blocks during that speech, 
uh, you can kind of be like, oh, well, it looks like that's, that's like five minutes. I can't do this in three minutes, so I can't design the negative block around planning to do that argument in three minutes, because it's not going to do three minutes. And maybe I could do it in four if I eliminated some stuff, but there's no way I can get it at three. So I need to rethink the way I'm designing my negative block, because the, the design where I thought I was going to extend this in three minutes, it's not viable based on what I know about how long it takes me to read my blocks. Number five, blocks are never complete. Blocks are never complete. One of the things that's difficult about this whole process is that it's hard to ever feel like you have accomplished anything. You, know, you write five more 2AC blocks, and you're not done with 2AC blocks. It's just that was the five that you needed to do you know, right then to just keep up. And there's five more that you need to do tomorrow, and there's five more that you need to do the next day. And you know, then you go to the next tournament, and there's 10 more, 15 more. There's always more blocks to write. There's always more blocks to time. There's always more blocks to edit. It's a never ending process, but you shouldn't think of that as if it is a barrier to success or a barrier to accomplishment. You should just understand that that's the reality of this process. It's not a finished thing. It's not something where one day you're not ready and then the next day you're ready. Readiness is a spectrum and debate and working on debate and block writing is just a constant battle to get closer to ready than you were the day before, but you're never fully ready. Uh, and I think if you understand that, you can kind of break it down and just do a little bit every day. You don't have to finish every block today. You don't have to finish every block tomorrow. But if you do one block today, two blocks tomorrow, another block the next day, it adds up, right? If you did one block a day for a week, you'd have seven blocks. I mean, think about how long it takes you to do seven blocks. I mean, if you sat down and were like, all right, today I have to write seven blocks, I got to take care of seven off case positions for my 2AC. Or, you know, I got to block out all these responses to my counter plan. Uh, or I gotta, you know, I gotta write blocks, seven blocks for my critique for the two NC. And that takes a lot of time. And if you're just planning on like, all right, I'll wait till the weekend. I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna write seven blocks or ten blocks or like, I'm just gonna knock out all these two AC blocks. That's a daunting task. Break it down. Just do it day by day, a little bit at a time. Certainly, if you've got time on the weekend to to knock out seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven blocks, that's great. But that should be on top of the one you did on Monday and the one you did on Tuesday and the one you did on Wednesday. Every day is a new opportunity to develop new blocks. Blocks also require constant revision. One of the thing that, things that separates really good debaters from kind of middling debaters is that middling debaters read the same blocks the whole year. And a lot of times they're camp blocks. And you know, the blocks that you all are writing now, you kind of have to because there's no one to get blocks from. So you're writing your 2AC blocks for your affirmative. You're writing your 2NC blocks on the neoliberalism critique or on the QPQ counterplan or whatever. And at Green Hill or at Wake Forest or whatever your first term of the year is, you're going to be reading those blocks. And then, you know, in October, you're going to be reading those blocks. And then November rolls around, you're still reading those blocks. And now all of a sudden it's 2014 and you're going to your first tournament in January. You're still reading those blocks. And then it's February. You're still reading those blocks. If that's you, that's failing. That is not success. That's terrible. And that's what middling kind of teams that, if they're real good, they'll be close to clearing. But if they're not that good, they'll be struggling to clear. I mean, that's, that's the way that they prepare. The way that a good team prepares is that every tournament, the important blocks are getting re revised, changed, improved, new cards are being included. You need to have a system to incorporate new arguments and new evidence into all of your blocks. Uh, you know, some of you are fortunate enough to have other people on your team, either your coaches or your teammates that are helping with getting you some new material. That needs to work its way into your blocks. You know, if someone cuts a new card that's a good answer to the neoliberalism K, that's got to be replacing whatever the card was that you were reading before. It's got to be in every 2AC when you make an argument like that. If they, you, know, you get a new biodiversity impact takeout, that better be in every block that answers the biodiversity impact. You should never have this new material that either you cut or someone else cut, uh, or that you saw someone else read and so you got their citation and you cut their card. You should never again read your old, worst biodiversity impact takeout. It just it boggles my mind how many times students uh, neglect to use the best material they have available. And that requires, uh, not doing that, requires a system and it requires commitment and it requires uh, understanding that just because you have a block to a particular argument does not mean you are done with that block. You will all have a block to you know, whatever the topicality argument is that your affirmative is most vulnerable to at the first tournament. Just because you have it doesn't mean you should move on to writing the Bataille K block or the like wipeout block or whatever. Topicality that is the most threatening topicality violation is something that will be read against you in almost every debate. You should be returning to that block after every tournament, incorporating the advice your judges give you, you know, adding cards, changing the way that you explain things, moving the order around to reflect uh, how you have learned to develop the argument in later speeches, 
It's a constant process and you can't settle for reading stuff that you have today in September and stuff that you have September in January and stuff that you have in January at the end of the year. That's not how it works. Number six, um, and this is only sort of related, know your role on the evidence food chain. And I don't totally like this analogy, but I couldn't think of a better one. Um, but it's something that I, I like to, to talk about. When you are a young debater, uh, now more than ever, you are almost entirely a consumer of evidence. And what I mean by that is you almost exclusively receive evidence. You receive evidence from camps, you receive evidence from your coaches, from your teammates, uh, from open source. You, know, you go see what Georgetown has read and you take their cards, you go see what Wake Forest has read, you take their cards, you go on the wiki, and the teams that have the full text, you take their cards, maybe you look at their citations, and you go get their cards uh, and, and kind of fill in the, the card text yourself. But you are almost entirely consuming evidence. As you get older, and where you all are in the, in the arc of your debate career, you need to become a producer of debate evidence. You can still consume, there's a role for that, and students that are good at consuming, especially uh, when they're the, the kind of primary evidence producer on their team, there's still, a, there's still a, a reason to do that, and that's still good. So you do still want to fill in back files and fill in kind of generic holes that you don't have time to do specific research on. But if you have the ability, that's something to outsource to your younger students on your squad. That's something to have uh, those that are lower on the evidence food chain take care of because that's maxing out their skills. That's challenging them to do something that is hard for them to do. Uh, you need to have time to investigate, research, and cut new evidence. You need to have new material ready to go into your debates. If students at your ability level stop producing evidence, it's going to stop being produced. It's, it's not a magical system. You can't only consume and consume and consume. If the seniors are consuming evidence, uh, the, the development of the topic stagnates and you get left in the dust against teams that have debaters who are producing new materials. Uh, you're left in the dust against uh, teams that are doing research all of the time and that know so much more about the topic than you do because they're investigating the latest developments and they're uh, coming up with new advantages and disadvantages and affirmatives and things like that. Certainly the research itself helps you win debates, having some new arguments, having some new evidence on generic arguments. You don't have to write a whole new DA, but if you have the latest research about China and its role in Latin America and you read the China advantage or you read the China disadvantage, that makes a huge difference in whether you're going to win the debate. If you're sticking with the evidence from camp uh, and your opponent has the evidence from October and it's a tournament in November, you know, they're going to win. And, and the reason they're going to win is because they were out there doing the research. They were out there producing. They weren't just consumers. Um, the process also of doing that makes you learn more and it helps you be more creative. It helps you in cross-sex. It helps you in rebuttals. It just makes you a more credible expert on topic issues. Um, and so I really want to challenge you. Uh, not to be one of the people that's just a consumer, not to be the team that in uh, December is still reading cards, uh, you know, dated July 1st or July 16th or whatever. You know, it's hilarious during the year. Uh, most people, when they cut cards that aren't really recent, I'll just say like 13 this year. Uh, but a lot of times you'll hear teams, you know, verbalize the, the date and the day, and it's, it's always in June and July, and it's not rocket science why that is. Those are just camp cards, but they didn't even take the time to unhighlight the 617 and just highlight the 13. Uh, don't be that person. That's just a sign that you're, you're sticking with stale material, you're not producing, you're not kind of pulling your weight. Uh, and it's not just about having the new cards, although that's important, it's about having the new knowledge. And if you kind of check out on the topic on uh, August 7th or whatever our last day here is, you're, you're not gonna win. All right, Roman numeral two. Seaver's nine universal truths of good block writing. <coughs> He, uh, he had this really long thing, and then in, interspersed, he would just drop in, in like bold and all caps, universal truth number one, universal truth number two. I think these are good. I'm just going to share them with you with a very brief discussion. Universal truth number one, WWD, which means warrants win debates. And that is very true. Warrants win debates. If you can't explain an argument, or if your evidence doesn't provide a reason to believe the conclusion that it's drawing, then it's just not a very good card. It's not a very good argument. 
And as you're writing blocks, you need to be very critical of your own arguments because your opponents are going to be critical of your arguments. <coughs> Take the block writing process as an opportunity to challenge the warrants, challenge the reasoning, the grounding for your arguments. And if you can't figure out what that reason is, then get that card out of your block, get that argument out of your block because it's not a good argument and it will lose under the scrutiny of uh, opposing criticism. <coughs> Universal truth number two. Every judge that fancies themselves as good tries to privilege qualified evidence over non-qualified evidence. That is a truth, I think. When you're making judgment calls about which cards to include and which cards not to include, you should care a lot about which ones you can defend as credible, as qualified, as authoritative on the subject matter that you're debating. You should think seriously about replacing the hyperbolic, strongly worded but terribly uncredible, terribly unqualified card with the better card that has the stronger warrant, even if it's not as powerfully worded. Because in a, in a contentious debate against a good opponent, the strong card is going to stand up, the weak hyperbolic card is going to get, you know, eaten apart, ripped apart. Eaten up, I guess is what I was trying to say. Universal truth number three, and this is the one that really dates this and is, is sort of funny. Uh, there is nothing more frustrating than paper jams. You all have never had to experience that. How many of you have had to debate on paper? How many of you got your start on paper? In our lab, it was like 50-50. Yeah, we're starting to get to the end of the era where people even have any experience with paper. Um, there is a real connection to paperless here, and I'm going to draw that in the third section. Um, but Siever's point was that in the era of paper debate, the lazy debater, the debater that didn't care very much about their blocks, uh, would often you had to tape down your cards onto a piece of paper and then it would be photocopied for the other members of your team or even for yourself so that you had a backup copy in case you lost it. A lazy debater, a debater that didn't really care about their blocks, would often mess up the taping. They wouldn't tape it down correctly or it would be crumbled or whatever and when you would put it through the copy machine it would jam. You would have to undo the copy, pull it out, try to straighten it, get out the tape, and it was a terribly tedious process. But his point was that the fact that there was a paper jam reflected that the student didn't care enough to do it right. And that is a universal truth about block writing, and it is a universal truth about preparation. And I'm going to talk way more about that uh, in my section, so we'll return to that. Universal truth number four. I love this one. The earlier you can facilitate the judge's comprehension of your arguments, the more likely you will win the debate. The earlier you can facilitate the judge's comprehension of your arguments, the more likely you will win the debate. This is why clear... <coughs> front-loaded, easily flowable, labeled arguments in blocks are so important. Your 1AC tag should be pristine. Your 1MC tag should be pristine. Your 2AC, should, you should be very thoughtful about every word that you're saying in your 2AC, in everything that you say in the, in the 2NC blocks, because you want the judge to understand your argument in the constructives, not just in the rebuttals. If the judge understands your argument on initial presentation, if they know that you have multifaceted warrants supporting your argument, if they understand the explanation of your argument, if they can kind of make sense of what you're saying, then they, that understanding will stick with them as they listen to the other team respond. And as a judge, it is much easier to uh, kind of think skeptically about the negatives attacks if we're, if we're pretending that we're affirmative. If I already know what the affirmative's argument is, than if I don't really understand the affirmative. If the first thing I understand is that the negative is saying that the affirmative doesn't make any sense, and I don't know what the affirmative says, I'm very easily persuaded that the negative is correct. The affirmative on this argument doesn't make any sense. The same thing is true in the 2AC, the same thing is true in the 1NC. Those early speeches, you need to be very thoughtful about what you're saying, what you want the judge to write down, and what you want the judge to understand. Universal truth number five. Judges need at least enough warrants as to tell the other team why they lost. This is kind of related to number one. But Siever's point here was that you should never have a block that can't stand up to a basic judge cross-examination. You need to have enough material, enough explanation, enough warrant in every block for the judge to be able to pick up your block, look at it and say, all right, other team, this is why I voted against you, and be able to distill the argument from your block to the other team. If the, if the block does not pass that test, if it requires you to interpret it, if it requires you to know what you meant, if it requires you to be able to kind of 
translate what you thought you were writing to what you thought you were saying, then your block has failed. Because the judge will not be able to distill what you have said and then communicate it effectively to the other team when they've explained that they voted for you and not for that other team. Universal truth number six. There is a limited amount of mental energy one can expend in a debate. There's a limited amount of mental energy one can expend in a debate. This is another great one because it's true. You have very limited preparation time in every debate. You have a lot of things that you need to be dealing with. Debate is a crazy multitasking challenge. You gotta be listening, you gotta be reading, you gotta be thinking, you gotta be writing. Uh, you have to be anticipating several moves forward. You gotta be working through the chess match while still paying close enough attention to listen to their arguments and to flow. It's a terribly challenging game. The more thinking you can do outside of the debate, the more you can spend your in-round thinking time focusing on the hard stuff, focusing on the round deciding stuff, focusing on the stuff that flips the close loss into a close win. You can't do it all during a debate. And you know, I, as a judge, I watch you all try to do it all the time. Uh, and it, it astounds me how much you can do. You, know, you don't have a block for this argument in the 2AC. Somehow you managed to put one together. Uh, you, you didn't, the, the, the partner didn't flow because they had to help put that block together. You know, somehow you still managed to say something in the 1AR and you know, they go for the argument and you, know, you give a 2AR and it's not terrible. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much you did there without being prepared for the debate, without being able to worry about all the in-round stuff, without having to think about strategy. You were just flailing. It was like you were drowning and you were just like barely keeping your head above water and you do that a lot. If you're doing that, you're not succeeding. You're not challenging top tier teams. You're not saving your mental energy for the hard stuff. You're just barely surviving. Universal truth number seven. The farther down a card is on a block, the less likely it will ever be read. I already talked about that one. It's pretty self-evident. This is why it is so important not to settle for the block you already have just because it's there. The status quo bias in blocks is staggering. You know, people, I, I've seen this where I've watched a team read a better card in a different debate, and then, then I judge them again uh, on a different argument, but the same argument that they needed to make was required, and they, they make a worse argument, or they read a worse card. And I say after the debate, you know, I would have really liked it if you would have read this card that I heard you, you know, at the last tournament, or that I heard you in the prelims. And they'll be like, yeah, we just didn't have that in our block. Like, okay, well, you know, that's... That's kind of embarrassing. I don't understand that. You had it in your other block, but you didn't have it in this one. I'm like, yeah, we just didn't copy it or whatever. We thought we had this one was good enough. It's not good enough. Universal truth number eight. You have an infinite amount of prep time before a debate round. He clarifies in his, in his notes that it's not actually infinite, um, but that it's a lot. So maybe you want to write down, you have a lot of prep time before a debate. You don't have a lot of prep time before a debate at a tournament, mind you. A lot of times you have very little prep time before a debate at a tournament, from the time that the pairing comes out to the time that the debate starts. But you should be ready for your debates before you even show up at the tournament. You should be ready for your debates before you even leave your school, or leave your city, or leave your whatever. And you should maximize the usefulness of all of that time so that your time before the debate and your time in the debate is useful for the things that you can't do when you're at home. Um, I'm going to talk more about that in my section. And universal truth number nine, the nature of writing is rewriting. The nature of writing is rewriting. And I think I've said enough about that. It's never done. Your 1AC is never done. Your 1NC is never done. Your 2AC blocks are never done. They are always unfinished projects that require constant revision. When a judge gives you an intelligent comment, says, you know, I really think you should word it this way instead, fix it. Do it that way. When another team reads a really good argument uh, and they have a really good piece of evidence, get that evidence and work that into your own box. When you lose an argument, you know, get feedback and say, all right, well, how can we change? How can we change this up? How can we set up a different strategy for the late rebuttals? Let's move around some arguments. Let's add a different argument. Let's take this one out. Constantly revise your blocks. They're not static. They're not printed. In the paper era, this made sense. You had printed blocks. It was hard work to kind of throw out that copy and to get this other one printed and copied and put back in there in the same place. That was hard. It is not hard to press the delete button and press the enter button and copy and paste and type new stuff. It's there, it's immediately available. Nature of writing is rewriting. Roman numeral number three, last section. The five guiding principles of good paperless block writing. 
So this is my take on how to adapt some of these principles and some other just ideas that I have about block writing to the era that you debate in, the paperless uh, debate era. Guiding principle number one, most important. Any preparation that could be done before the tournament should be done before the tournament. Any preparation that could be done before the tournament should be done before the tournament. <coughs> the reason that we want to prepare our arguments in advance is so that we have the ability to express our arguments in the debate in the most polished, elegant, efficient, flowable, persuasively packaged way possible. We don't want the second or third or fourth or fifth best version of our arguments given to the judges. We want the best version of our arguments delivered to our judges. There's this concept called decision fatigue, which I think plays uh, an important role in debate. Uh, and it's just the idea that we can only, as human beings, as human brains, make so many decisions before we just get tired and we can't think clearly anymore. We can't make good decisions anymore. And debate tournaments are a great test of decision fatigue. You know, think about at the end of a tournament, the end of a long tournament day, the question like, where do you want to go to dinner? can sometimes be staggering. It's like, where do you want to go to dinner? Uh, <coughs> what's food? I don't know. Just pick for me. That's natural. The reason is that in every debate, you're making a million decisions, and you're making tough decisions, stress decisions. You should not make yourself or put yourself in a position to make a lot of stressful decisions that you don't need to make at a debate tournament. There's going to be plenty of stressful decisions. What are you going to go for in the 2NR? You know, how are you going to answer this argument? How are you going to adapt to this new argument that someone read against you? you know, some, your partner made a mistake. How are you going to come back from that? If someone challenged you in the cross section and you messed up, how are you going to still win that debate? That's the kind of stuff that you can't really fix before you get to the debate tournament. But what are we going to say in our 1NC against this team's affirmative is something that you should already know. There should be no thought at all before the debate into what you're going to say, unless they've changed it up. And then you should say, all right, here's what we were going to say. Now, the thing that we couldn't have prepared beforehand, what are we going to say now that they have changed it up? If you are a team that regularly puts 1NCs together at the tournament, you suck. Not a little, you totally suck. Because that's something that must be done at home. You should not be figuring out what you're going to say on the negative at the tournament. You know every affirmative on the national wiki. If you have a 1NC, you know most of the time what teams are even at, at the tournament. Every affirmative that any of those teams has read, you should already know what you're going to say. You should have a 1NC document ready to go. You should have a general idea of what your strategy will be. It takes almost no time to do that at home if you spend an hour two hours, you can get that done. If you plan to do that in the 10 or 15 minutes before a debate, you are spending that 10 or 15 minutes in a high stress environment making bad decisions about what's going to be in the 1NC. And you're not spending that time thinking about how to execute the strategy that you already thought about. You're not thinking about how to adapt to the judge. You're not thinking about how to anticipate the other team's tactics and to respond to them. You're not thinking about how to and you'll know, do a little bit of spot research to help out a specific argument. You're not talking about the new argument that this team read in the previous debate. You're just flailing. You're just barely staying alive. You're just barely having something to say. If you can do it before the tournament, do do it before the tournament. Now, you clearly can't do everything, but you should do as much as possible. And you should do more of that and less of the kind of things that a lot of you like to do. Cutting the you know the fiftieth DDEV card or the fiftieth you know update to your warming good file or whatever you know that's not productive work. You're not going to read fifty DDEV cards in a debate. You're not going to read fifty warming cards in a debate. You're not going to need to have you know copied all of Georgetown's latest you know advantages cards into your document. You don't need all of Georgetown's thumper cards you know copied into a document. That's work that. Sure, you can do that if you want, if you have extra time, but if you don't have 1NCs ready, if you don't have 2ACs against all of the arguments that your opponents make done, then what are you doing? You know, that is a terrible use of your time. Guiding principle number two. Blocks should be well formatted. You should use a template. I don't know, I mean, I like verbatim. I don't know why anyone doesn't like verbatim. But if you don't like verbatim, that's fine. If, the, if your team just doesn't use verbatim, then use whatever your team uses. But you should use consistent styles. 
Your blocks should be elegant. They should be well-formed. You should use underlining, and you should use italicizing, and emphasis and highlighting, and you should use them the same way every time. Everything that's highlighted should be the same. Everything that's emphasized, that should be the thing that you're supposed to emphasize in your speech. Everything that's italicized or underlined in a tag of a card or the tag in the analytical argument, should be that should be for a reason. That should be, well, that's something you need to emphasize. You should maintain consistency throughout all of that. You should consistently cite your cards. You should be complete in your citation. You should research, if you need to, the credentials of your author and information about the source, if it's not something that's commonly understood. Taking a little bit of extra time to make sure that you can answer questions about your evidence and defend the credibility of your author or defend the credibility of your source, uh, it, you know, maybe it takes an extra one minute as you're cutting that card, but it could make the difference between that card getting thrown out of a debate for no reason and you being able to look credible and make a connection with the judge on a good card that you just spent the time cutting. <laughs> Maintain paragraph breaks or use the verbatim thing that puts the little pilcro in between the paragraphs. A lot of judges, me, care to read paragraphs because we think that human beings speak and write in paragraphs, and so we care where the paragraph break is. Judges that don't care won't <laughs> mind the tiny pilcro. Don't be lazy just because you can be lazy. In the same way, when you copy something from a PDF or from some document that has weird formatting, and don't do the thing where you like F3 at all and there's a million pill crows in your card, or there's a million gaps in all the words, and there's like the, the hyphen and then a giant gap, and you know the, everything shows up as spelled wrong, and it just looks like garbage. Take the one minute or maybe the 30 seconds to clean that up and eliminate that. You should be proud of what you are presenting. You should take pride in your evidence. You should take pride in your citations. You should take pride in your tags. Your formatting expresses that. One really pro tip is it's fine if you want to shrink the text that you're not reading uh, a little bit so that it makes it easier to read the text that you are reading. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is a strategic liability to make parts of your evidence small because it doesn't serve you any strategic purpose, but it does invite the obvious connection moment for the other team, which they do in every debate, which is in the four-point font that you didn't want me to read, your evidence says this. And it doesn't matter that your evidence says that or doesn't say that, it gives the other team an opportunity to make that connection. And they're probably making that up. But if I hear in the four-point font in the cross-sex and your evidence is in four-point font, I'm gonna think they have something to hide. They're you know, they must be hiding something. Why would they put it in four-point font if they weren't highlighting? If they weren't hiding it, <coughs> your card should look good. Your blocks should look good. It matters. Those of you that don't care enough to make them look good are the same students that don't care enough to write good blocks. That don't care enough to research good evidence. There is a strong correlation between individuals that format their blocks well and individuals that write good blocks. And there is a very strong correlation between people who don't and people who are lazy and people who don't do good debate work. Guiding principle number three, blocks should be well written. And I mean this kind of literally, like written in the sense of good writing. You should use simple sentences. You should use periods. You should limit commas and m dashes, just kind of one per tag or one per argument. Debaters that write in run-on sentences tend to talk in run-on sentences. Debaters that write in run-on sentences and sentence fragments and groupings of sentence fragments tend to sound like they are saying groups of sentence fragments. You've seen some, uh, some blocks written by people that I would assume you respect. You've seen blocks from uh, like Ken Strange, you saw some of his blocks. They're just written sentences, simple sentences that communicate an argument. They're active voice, they're clear. They're not what I would describe as G-chat language. You should never use G-chat language in your box. You should never use abbreviations and kind of like shortened versions. You should never just assume that you'll tag the card on the fly in the debate. You should never have a card that's like lol, more ev, or whatever. I look at your blocks all the time, and 90% of you do that, and it blows my mind. <laughs> edit your blocks just like you would edit your speeches or edit your papers in school. Eliminate inefficiencies. Eliminate passive voice. Use bullet points or use numbering. Use substructure. Use paragraph breaks. White space. Make your blocks intelligible. 
Make them look like something that's easy to read. Make them easy to read, and they will be easy to read. And what you might not understand is that easy to read blocks are also easy to listen to blocks, and they are easy to flow blocks. And if your goal is for your judge to flow your arguments, then you should write your blocks with your judge's comfort in mind, not with your own sense of, I'm going to just say eight things, and I'm going to put M dashes in between them, and I'm going to you know, spell everything wrong, and I'm not going to use any capitalization ever, and I'm going to use a lot of kind of colloquial G-chat kind of language. You wouldn't turn in a paper that looks like that. Don't put that in your blocks. It is not in your best interest. It doesn't make you look cool. It might make you look cool to your friends, but it doesn't make you look cool to your judges. And who cares what your friends think of your blocks? Beat your friends with good blocks and they'll come around. Guiding principle number four. Blocks should be well organized. The test here is that you should immediately know where all of your materials are. You should have a strong grasp on the location of all necessary materials. It astonishes me how terrible students are at this, and it does not make sense. Mahoney said this morning that if you are not good at paperless, you are not good at debate, and I agree with him. I would say if you are not good at organization, you are not good at debate. You are putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage. It's like you were in the NBA and you decided that you were going to weigh, wear like a weighted vest around as you played basketball. You know, if you were LeBron James, you could probably be, still be pretty good, but why would you choose to wear a weighted vest while playing basketball? When you don't know where any of your stuff is, or when your stuff is so disorganized that you kind of know where it is, but it requires a lot of thinking to figure out where it is, you know, all right, we're debating uh, Chattahoochee. I remember uh, at this one tournament, a couple of tournaments ago, we debated them in a prelim, and I think I put together a one and see front line against that advantage. Let me think. All right, it was the, it was not the first tournament, it was the second tournament. I think it was round three. All right, let me find those speech documents. Um, well, that was the point where I was putting the speech documents in the speech document folder. Oh, no, wait, it's when I was putting it in my private tub speech document. Oh, no, Oh, wait, oh, I think it's in my email because I probably emailed it. Let me check my email. Um, no, it's not round three. Maybe it was round four. All right, let me find. Oh, no, that's in the other folder. All right, I'm clicking over there. Oh, here it is, round four. Here's the front line that I made to Chattahoochee. Seriously? That's how you organize your stuff? You have to find the speech document that you read this in? Where's the file? Where's the front line to Chattahoochee? Why isn't that in the case name to Chattahoochee's affirmative? You have to have a system, and it doesn't really matter what your system is as long as you stick to it. And I would give you kind of two standards for determining whether your system is good or bad. Number one, is your, stand, is your system simple? If it is simple, it is good. If it is complex, it is probably bad because it's difficult to stick, uh, stick to, to consistently do. Number two, is it reliable? Does it just kind of work? Can you find what you need? If it is simple and it is reliable, it works. It does not matter exactly how you do it. But if this is an issue for you, and it is, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because most of you should raise your hands, this is a place where you can make radical improvements in your win-loss percentage because you can get your best materials in every debate and you can drastically increase the amount of prep time you have, you can dramatically reduce the amount of stress you have before and during debates, and you can do it all for the big, big cost of nothing. It's not hard, it just requires diligence and doing it. You don't have to pay anyone. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to stop Facebooking. You don't have to, you know, quit GChat. You don't have to stop watching TV. You just have to start caring about how you organize your materials. One of Seaver's big things is that he really hated the AT thing that people do. So like AT argument. So he would, you know, AT hegemony prevents U.S. China war. And his thing was. AT, hedge prevents U.S. China war. All right, what does that mean? Does that mean that the, the block is going to answer the argument that hegemony causes China war? Or is that going to say that hegemony causes China war? And everyone would be like, most people would be like, well, it's going to answer the claim that hegemony causes war. And he would say, are you sure? How confident are you in that? Are you willing to not even look at the card, the first tag, to make that decision? This is the final round of the national championship. Are you committed? You're just going to go all in. That's definitely what that means. And you trust that everyone believes the same thing. And he would say, you know, you are not going to make that call. You're going to look at the first card. You're going to look at the first tag. And in that moment that you have to look at the thing and then you look at the first tag, that's two or three seconds and that's a decision and that's some thinking time that you wasted. And that you wasted on an organizational thing that you could fix. 
The era of the document map has made this both different and it has made the problem even worse. Because you only get a little bit of screen real estate over there on the left to put your title of your blocks. And so you can't put what Siever likes. Siever likes they say, and he likes to put in quotation marks what they have said. And he likes to be pretty uh, extensive with it. If you've seen some of Repco's stuff, it's the same philosophy. That made a lot of sense on paper, because when, with paper, it didn't matter how wide it was. You could have a giant block at the top, and if you could just immediately read that and know exactly what it meant, that was golden. That was great. In that era, that made sense. In this era, you, the individual user of the file, needs to write every block title of every file. You need to review them, and you need to make sure that you know what those block titles mean. Because what you understand a certain very small doc map block title to mean is going to be different than someone else. And it's very difficult to kind of be on the same page with everyone when we're talking about just a couple of words. You know, 2NC Cuba, what the heck does that mean? You know, 2NC human rights, what does that mean? I have no idea. You might know what that means, but I don't know what that means. And so my suggestion is that the person that writes the file do the Seaver thing, do the Repco thing. Write out explicitly what the argument is that's being answered. They say United States hegemony causes U.S. Sino war. And then every person that preps the file can do whatever they want with that block title, and they can put whatever they want that document map version of that to be. So some of them might be AT China War. Some of them might be like No Hedge China War. Some of them might just be like A2 China War. Some of them might just say China War. Who knows? You know, you all have different things that you want to have in that document map. Do not depend on other people's doc map skills and do not depend on them saving you prep time in the debate. You need to do that. It doesn't take a long time and it has this amazing added benefit that you have to look at every block in every file, which you should be doing anyway. When you are organizing your blocks, use the full spectrum of possibilities. So you can have separate files. Within a single file, you can have a pocket, you can have hats, you can have block titles, you can have tags. Figure out which thing makes the most sense for the particular file. Figure out what makes the most sense for how you like to organize your stuff. Some people like really large Word documents and they love to play with the document map. And they love to kind of close most of it but open part of it. Some people don't like having a giant document map and they prefer to have several files open. It doesn't matter, it's just what works for you, but you need to figure out what works for you and you need to stick to that system. And you need to be able to rely on that system so that you know, all right, the 2AC, I'm, I'm affirmed against this team, I gotta have all the 2AC things up that I'm gonna need uh, and they gotta be quickly accessible, shootable over to my, to my speech document and I need to have as much time as possible during the 1NC and 2AC prep to make precise revisions and to write out specific arguments that respond to things that happen in this debate. I should spend as little time as possible just doing things that I should have already done. Finding things, moving things, editing things that I should have already edited that, that did not need to be edited just for this debate. Think about organization seriously. The beginning of the season is the best time to do it because it's when you're, you get a fresh start on the new topic. Take it seriously, get better at it, and it will pay immense dividends. I, I can't <coughs> emphasize enough how important it is to organize your stuff. Mm -hmm. Guiding principle number five. Blocks should be well presented. Well presented. Nobody talks about this. Um, Georgetown figured this out, I think, uh, and Andrew Arsh will tell you about this. If you're ever <clears throat> talking to Andrew Arsh, you all love Andrew Arsh, of course. Um, it's really important what your judges think of your evidence. It's really important what judges think of you, and you kind of know that. You talked about ethos recently. Uh, a big part of that is the judge's <coughs> overall impression of you as a debater. Some teams have the reputation for having very well-formatted, clean, elegant looking blocks. They give you a speech document after the round and it's beautiful. Everything is organized. It's all in the same format. It's readable. Uh, it's every card that was marked is clearly marked. Uh, it's clear what highlighting was read. It's immaculately presented. I, you know, when I did this for our lab, College Prep was the team that came to mind. College Prep, Elsa last year, every time I would judge her and I get a speech document, it was perfect. And she didn't even use verbatim. She used some like weird old template. Uh, that I thought was kind of weird looking, but it looked great. Like all the cards were the same, there were clear headers, highlighting was there, it was beautiful. And it just reflected the professionalism with which she approached debate, and it helped her credibility. 
This is not just true of debate. This is true of life. And this is an important lesson that you can learn. Uh, you know, a lot of you are like, it doesn't matter. We could, you know, print out our card on a napkin and write it on a, with a crayon or whatever. And if it's a good card, the judge should just vote on it and, you know, suck it. Because we're anti-authoritarian and it doesn't matter what our evidence looks like. Which is why we've showed up to the tournament wearing clown pants and, a, you know, a tank top. And that, that's just how we roll. We're anti-authority. We don't want to make our stuff look nice for the man. You're an idiot. Uh, here's an excerpt from Peter Vogt, who is a senior writer at Monster.com, the resume website, and it's in an article called, Your Resume's Look is as Important as Its Content. Imagine you're an employer, and you have two resumes in front of you. One is filled wall-to-wall -wall with text and uses four different fonts. It's also peppered with dozens of bolded, italicized, and underlined words and phrases. The second resume also offers a lot of information, but you can quickly scan the document because it makes good use of white space, features clear and consistent section headings, and uses bullets to make important items stand out. Which resume would you look at first? If you're like most employers who may have to evaluate hundreds of resumes each week, you'll proceed directly to the second resume. Why? Because it's inviting to your eyes and your attention span, while the first resume is just the opposite. If you want your resume to have a good chance of being read by prospective employers, you must invest time and energy not only in its content, but also in its look. That applies to debate. Your evidence is not that much different than your resume. You're presenting the work product that you are going to use, uh, or that you have used, to try to persuade the judge that you have won this argument. You've won this debate. You want the judge to choose your argument. The way that your argument is presented to the judge during the debate obviously matters, but the way that your evidence, your supporting materials are presented to the judge after the debate also matters. The debate equivalent of four different fonts peppered with a bunch of weird formatting, y'all do that. That's what you do. Your cards are all in a different color and they're highlighted in different ways and they're all from different templates and there's no block heading and there's all these weird things in the document map and it's totally unnavigable and it just looks like garbage. It looks like you didn't care at all about preparing your materials and presenting your evidence in the case. Can you imagine an attorney presenting evidence before the jury uh, and they've got like, oh, we got some crime scene photos. Let me uh, pull out my iPhone. You know, you got, they're right here. We can pass it around. You can just kind of look. You know, it's kind of dark and my screen is small, but you get the picture. It doesn't matter how I present them. You'll believe them anyway, right? Because it doesn't matter. Of course not. They, you know, they blow them up and they get them, you know, on nice paper or framed and they get a nice display and it's, it's all a big show. Uh, second anecdote on this. The, some of you, I don't know if anyone's heard about this. This was kind of funny when it came out and I, it was interesting. Uh, this person in the New York Times Magazine, I think it was in the New York Times Magazine, they did this poll uh, that they didn't tell anyone about uh, where they presented an article by a physicist that was like, asteroids are not going to explode the world. And they had a poll at the end that was like, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Uh, take this poll. And they asked, like, do you agree with this or do you not agree with this? And that was just sort of a trick because they weren't picking whether you were an optimist or pessimist, what they did is that each time the article loaded, it randomly uh, used one of six fonts, one of six different fonts. And from this, they figured out that the font that an article is presented to on the internet makes a statistically significant difference in how people respond to that article, whether they're persuaded by the argument. So they found that there is a small difference, but it's about a one to 2% difference uh, and they say you are collecting these data in an uncontrolled environment. So to see any difference is impressive. Many online marketers would kill for a 2% advantage, either in more clicks or more clicks leading to sales. Truth is not typeface dependent, but a typeface can subtly influence us to believe that a sentence is true. Could it swing an election, induce us to buy a new dinette set, change some of our most deeply held and cherished beliefs? Indeed, we may be at the mercy of typefaces in ways that we are only dimly beginning to recognize. An effect, subtle, almost indiscernible, but irrefutably there. If a, if a simple change in font can change the way that a person, without, their, without them even knowing, interprets an argument and is either persuaded or unpersuaded by it, of course, the way that your evidence is presented will make a difference in how the judge interprets that evidence, whether they think about it or not. They can't help but think about it. One team has presented garbage. The other team has presented an elegant text. The elegant text can't help but be more persuasive. We are wired that way. And it doesn't matter whether they consciously know that or not. So your speech documents during the debate, something that might be seen by the judge, should be well formatted. 
The fact that you have well formatted and well organized your speech document also just reflects that you are organizing your thoughts and that you are organizing your speech. If you're one of the people that speech documents are just like collections of copy and pasted stuff in different fonts and different sized cards and everything is garbage and there's no document map, you are selling yourself short. You are terrible at paperless. You are terrible at organizing your thoughts and organizing your material. <coughs> The post-round documents that you show to the judge. So sometimes the judge will just say, can I get all the speech documents? And if you give a speech document like that, you're instantly going to tell the judge, you know, you're not professional. You're not very well prepared. Your materials uh, are not things that you care much about. If the judge asks for a post-round document, it should be well formatted. It should be well organized. It should be clearly labeled. One thing that Georgetown has figured out is that you can use the document that you give the judge to help them make the decision you want them to make. You can organize the speech document in the way you want them to read the cards that you put first. So you think, all right, if they evaluate the counter plan first, that's good for us. So I'm going to put our counter plan cards first. And instead of just dumping all of my counter plan cards, I'm going to add a block title for each warrant that we extended in the 2AR about our counter plan and the solvency deficit to the counter plan. And underneath that, I'm going to put each card that reflects that solvency deficit. And if there's any cards that were marked, or if there's any cards that are useful for multiple purposes, I will indicate that clearly in the document so that the judge doesn't have any questions about which evidence was useful. If I want them to then evaluate the disadvantage, I put the disadvantage cards first. And if I think that my best argument in the 2AR is an impact argument, I put my impact argument there. And I say, you know, hat, impact card, DA cards about impact, you know, under the DA pocket. And then I say, you know, first warrant is, you know, no escalation. I put each card that is relevant to no escalation under that. And then I put the second warrant block title on each card under that. Some judges are just going to do their own thing, you know, no matter what, it doesn't matter. But a lot of judges are just going to read the cards in the order that you presented them. And if, if even 5% or 10% of your judges do that, why wouldn't you take the extra one or two minutes to put together a well-formatted document to help those judges reach the conclusion you want them to decide? Seaver had this comment. He said, you know, imagine you're in the final round of the national championship. He, he would ask students sarcastically, do you want to be handing this judge, who's the swing vote on the national championship panel, crumpled up paper with crossouts, misspellings, glue marks, and who knows what else on these things with the hope that he or she will think your evidence is better than your opponent's? And the obvious answer is no, you wouldn't do that. The paperless equivalent is no less damaging to your credibility. One thing uh, to really be cognizant of is <coughs> practice opening up these documents on computers that don't have the template that you use in Sol. This is especially important if you don't use verbatim. You know, some of you who have these weird home-cooked templates, you open it on a computer with verbatim, and all of a sudden it looks terrible. You should know that, and you should figure out how to fix that so that the judges are seeing the version of the evidence that you want them to see, so that the judges aren't looking at evidence that's terrible. The reason that this is so important is that it's your last moment in the debate to make a good impression. If you make a good impression, it can confirm the narrative that the judge is already developing about you as a team and you as a debater. You showed up on time, you look good, you're dressed well, you're ready to go, you made smart arguments, it seemed like you had good evidence, you had some good comprehension of that evidence, you debated well, and then you received the document from that team and you're like, wow, yeah, they, I was right. Look at this. I mean, they, are, they got their stuff together. This is a well-prepared professional team that takes it seriously. That's your last chance. At that point, you can't influence the judge anymore. You can do it a little bit. You, know, you sit down, you keep working, you get ready for the next debate. Even if it's the final round of the tournament, you act like you're still working, like this is still work. You don't play around with your friends. You don't leave the room. You don't turn on loud music. You, know, you don't have a posse come, come over and distract you. you. You're still at work. That is your last opportunity to shape whether the judge will vote for you. And there are a lot of debates that are very close. There are a lot of debates that could go either way. And if I was you, I would definitely want to have control as much as possible over who wins that close debate. The opposite is also true. You know, a team shows up late. The team's not dressed very nice. The team's terrible at paperless during the debate. The team says some kind of silly arguments. The team doesn't seem to know what they're talking about. And then the team hands you a speech document that's just garbage, that's terribly formatted, that doesn't have a document map, that's in all sorts of different weird fonts. That just confirms the narrative the judge already had about the team. I mean, they're jokers. They're not taking this seriously. If you're judging the jokers against Georgetown, Georgetown wins every time. And you should try to emulate that professionalism. It's not going to win you debates that you lost but it's going to be relevant 
whether consciously or not, in a couple of debates this year. And a couple of debates this year could be the difference between you know, achieving your goals and falling a debate short, or falling two debates short. And it's something that you can totally, entirely control. So much of debating you can't control. This is something you can control. And why you choose not to, I don't understand. So, uh, the reason this is called the art of block writing is that that's something that Siever told me. Uh, and so, I began with the Siever quote. I'm going to end with a Siever quote. And then you can ask questions. Uh, and I really like this quote, and I think this again, these two quotes kind of tell you a lot about the way Siever thought about preparation. Uh, and so I'm going to share this with you both because I agree with it and to kind of challenge you to adopt this mentality. Here's what Siever says. Treat your blocks as if it were your art, because it is your art. You are a debater. Debaters prepare. They block. These pages are your canvas. How you treat your canvas mirrors how you feel about your art. Your blocks, in the end, are a reflection of yourself. <coughs> they help define what kind of debater you are or plan to be. The rest is up to you. I recommend you take your craft seriously. You can't control what your judges will think and how they will vote. In the end, you can only try to influence your judges. But you have complete control over how you choose to prepare for your debates. The essence of this preparation is your blocking. Treat it with the respect that it deserves. Frank Siever, 2003, end of lecture. All right, questions? You jacked up?